Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And on this episode, you know what we're going to do? Sing heavy metal. <laughs> and set towns on fire. We're burn them to the ground. Burn. I just on want to this watch episode the of Delve, we're talking about the bad guys. Yeah, but not necessarily the bad guy as much as being the bad guy. Being so, evil. Yeah, we're talking about what happens when you go to the dark side of the force. What, what happens, happens when the party goes rogue? When the party goes rogue. Uh, yeah, so on the last episode, we were talking about, you know, the traditional good path that most people go down. Now we are talking about probably the atypical path of what happens when your party is essentially evil or variations therein. Murder hobos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because no one ends up doing that. <laughs> Absolutely Nobody. not. Not once. Okay, so just a basic question out on the front. What happens when your party is just terrible. <laughs> just the worst. It's just I the mean, worst. Generally, they get in jail, right? Is that what happens? I think so. I think so. They usually go to jail. I, I mean, uh, things things end up on fire, like we said before. Um, you have those uh, terrible quests from, like, Baldur's Gate, where you, <laughs> where you have to compose the suit of skin or whatever that was. <laughs> you know, the generally evil quests, I suppose, that might not even have all that much of a net benefit, so to speak. Um, but, but I mean, the general idea of, um, well, let's, let's think of it this way. Are you familiar with a game series called Overlord? Uh, I think so. Okay. Vaguely. Uh, so in Overlord, uh, basically the idea is that it takes the fairy tale of the, the heroes and villains and it flips it on its head and you are now the villain of the piece and you have to stop these do-gooder heroes that are always ruining your plans. Essentially that, <laughs> yes. Perfect. And so you have to create a whole bunch of minions that are going to help you on your on your mission. And you look like basically one of the um, Nazgul's from the from the Lord of the Rings. You're you're I do want to be a Nazgul. Yeah, you got the helmet. You, you're the Witch King. You have that helmet on and the whole thing. Um, and and I mean, I, I suppose usually when people are thinking you're playing the bad guy, that's probably their image. Of what that means, it, it's it's that traditional I'm a mustache twirling villain, ha ha, wah ha ha ha. Um, but I, I, in reality, a lot of times that's not necessarily going to be what we're talking about for parties. I I don't think a lot of times the party comes in and says, "Yes, we are indeed the mustache twirling villain, and we are going to go and do some evils now." I would like a barbershop quartet with mustaches and villain and switch uh, blades. They yes. got straight razors. <laughs> Yeah. In front, of the bar in front of the barbershop quartet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, a, you know, a, a, in a lot of ways, that's, you know, what we would normally think of as an evil party, like a truly evil party. Um, in general, though, I think what we usually end up with are parties that, in very much contrast to the last episode, are going to do the very selfish thing. Rather than the selfless thing, they're gonna steal everything. They're gonna steal everything that isn't locked down. Uh, and basic, basically, how most people end up playing RPGs. <laughs> mm. You know, it's your tip. It's your typical. Okay, yeah. Um, I, you know, I go into an RPG. Yes, I want to do the good thing. Also, that's an open chest. Uh, that's a that's a drawer I can get into. Can I steal everything in that drawer? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you left everything here out in the open. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's, it's always those things like I always feel bad for the shopkeepers that decided to show all of their wares on the table in front of me. It's like if you think I'm not going to probably pick it up everything. And then they then you just put a bucket over their head and 
Oh, good. <laughs> they, oh, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, can't do that anymore. Not in Skyrim, at least. Yeah, sorry. But, like, in New Vegas, there's that whole thing um, where you can go into, like, the Silver Rush, and they have all the energy weapons and everything laid out on the table and on the shelves and stuff, and it's like, yeah, boy, if I have a couple stealth boys, I'm taking everything you have there. <laughs> I'm taking all the high power. You just left it on the table. You think I wasn't going to steal it all. Um, so, so yeah, I think in a lot of ways when the party is going bad, what probably people are thinking about is the idea that, yeah, you're probably stealing everything that isn't locked down and shaking down some people for money, maybe. Um, not necessarily the murder hobo stuff. I mean, that too. They don't maybe not, they maybe don't think about that, but I mean, that is definitely. Not down the right path. Yeah, yeah. Probably not, like, just for the sake of it, though. I don't see a lot of people that are like, you know what I'd like to do in my game today? Well, I'd like to go and murder a lot of people. There's That that usually isn't how the party interacts with the game world. <laughs> do you usually tell me that's how I interact with the party? You interact with the party, but see, the party is not the, is not the you know, catalyst there. It's it's you telling them I really wouldn't do that, and then they try it, and then, and, and then I'm like, well, I you tried it. Now and, you will burn, you will burn face, for eternity. Face the consequences of face. my evil. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I was kind of interested in the idea. Like, if you look at a, an alignment chart in D and D, uh, there's there's all the good alignments, and then there's all the evil alignments because the idea is that you could essentially be on either side of this. And so there are specifically some characters that are evil. A lot of times, like warlocks, will be necromancers. Obviously, are specifically evil. I mean, my warlock was chaotic good. Yeah, but a lot of times the warlocks are evil. Right, I mean sometimes. Okay, mine was also gonna cross class into paladin. So I mean, oh yeah, I guess you would have to be fairly good. What 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 are some other ones though? Like sorcerers, sorcerers. Sorcerers aren't usually they're pretty neutral. I think most classes are fairly neutral. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm the ones to... that tend toward evil more often t are are the ones that are more aggressive. I would say, not like, necessarily even that. Barbarians are t pretty neutral. I don't know. It, it, those all really depend. Uh, like, good is way easier to specify for classes, I think. Sure. Uh, generally speaking. Yeah. Than evil is for them. Because um, aside from, like, the warlock being seen as what be evil. Um, right. Or necromancer. But necromancer is not technically a class itself. Right. Um, even your you rogue. Know, even your rogue isn't necessarily evil. They're usually more chaotic than... They're just a chaotic medieval. force, yeah. Yeah. I think it's actually kind of interesting that there are some classes like paladins that are traditional, like, they, they're just good. Like, there's there's some that are just known as good. There really aren't all that many classes that are specifically edging toward, like, they're, they're saying, no, you're evil. If you're not evil, that you can't play the thing. Like, <laughs> there's not a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a black evil. guard, for instance, uh, would be evil. Sure. Or an anti-paladin would be evil. Right. Um, right. But yeah. There, there's a lot that start out in, in a good capacity. Usually the, uh, the, the evil part comes later. <laughs> like, like when you're a fallen paladin or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't necessarily think, and especially when from a GM perspective, uh, usually you don't uh, tell your party that they're going to go down that path. Well, your goal today is, uh, see that town? Destroy that town. <laughs> so, some warlord told you to destroy this town because they're trying to put up, you know, sheep stalls or something like that. They, they have, they have, um, uh, real estate opportunities presenting to themselves <laughs> that they'd like you to help them with. Uh, yes. And so go and do that. That's not... T I, I don't know if I've ever played a scenario that was like that or that anyone even asked me to. Right. Um, so so uh, when we talk about people being terrible, it's usually uh, by accident. And this is, this is actually where I wanted to go with this, is the question. What... When does it happen by accident that your party just ends up being the bad guys? 
Okay. Accidentally bad guys. Yeah. Oops, we were the bad guys all this time. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, well, maybe we weren't bad guys all this time, but I, uh, one of the better... We were the bad guys all along. We were the bad guys all Are we the baddies? Yeah, we are the baddies. Uh, Mitchell and Webb, folks, there's a reference. Um, but um, one of the better examples that I have, at least from video gaming, is I don't know if you ever played uh, Spec Ops The Line. Nope. Nope, okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you a spoiler for that game, but you don't care because it's been out for 10 years and you probably wouldn't want to play it. But <laughs> but anyway, uh, in Spec Ops The Line, the idea is that you are like these the, this this dispatch of soldiers and you are going uh, into Dubai and uh, there's there's a, a bunch of stuff that's going on there. And there's a few times in that game that completely redefine what you're doing, like the time where you're trying to destroy enemy soldiers, but you can only see them on like a uh, an infrared camera. So you can't see any of them, and then uh, something bad happens. You you destroy his. You know, oh wow, we were able to like you know use mortar fire and like we destroyed all the enemies, and then you realize, oh no, those weren't soldiers, those were civilians. They were actually you know trying to you know cover cover themselves in the trenches uh, to make sure that they didn't get killed and. That kind of influences the rest of the game where they're like, oh, wow, we might be the bad guys here, folks. Yeah. And the rest of it is more of a Heart of Darkness story, in case you're not aware. <laughs> but uh, it, it very much actually the same kind of <laughs> Apocalypse Now form as, as the movie. Um, brilliant story. And it has those turns at several points where you're like, oh, I was the problem the entire time. But they had no intention at that time of doing the wrong thing. Thought they were just fighting a war. They were not fighting just a war. Uh, in similar fashion, if we were looking at tabletop gaming, I can think of one or two times a, a city got set on fire, but it was because we were trying to escape from a detention center. And now you might say, well, why were we being detained? Uh, why were you being detained? We were being detained uh, for questioning in some uh, violent incidences that might have happened that got some people killed that is I maintain was not necessarily our fault. Um, so it was accidental. It was it was accidental. And we did we we did not do the thing. I to, I just told some guards that there were some bad people in a basement, and they went down. And if they got killed by the bad people in the basement, because I might have underplayed how dangerous they were, and if we might have been running with a guy who was part of a secret cabal, and we needed to escape with him because he had valuable information that we needed. That's that's all tangential. Sure. Okay. All, doesn't doesn't mean and if we just ended up in a jail cell and they didn't want to let us go and they had already they had tortured our friend who was apparently part of the bad cabal thing anyway um you know if we need to blast out the back of that uh station and everything is on fire uh so that we can cover our exit and escape town you know what what do you want from us what do you want from us real rations <laughs> We're never going back to the town again. <laughs> of course not. That's what all you can say. Um, but uh, in in seriousness, folks, uh, the whole being terrible or being the bad guy on accident, whether whether that ends up being a theme that you want to work with or not, does seem like something that happens more often than not in the, in games. You want to be the good guy, and you go down the good path. But along the way, some stuff happens. That's why there's whole combat systems in, in tabletop gaming. So that you have to resolve some things through conflict. Um, it's not Conflict and violence. Conflict and violence. Now, uh, in, in general, your experience, do you find that a lot of times people are going to try to use the non-violent solution at the start... Or are they just going straight to the murder hobo? Uh, in which situation? 
any situation, you're going on a mission, uh, and you're you're supposed to let's say you're supposed to rescue some prisoners from uh from you know the uh, bandit king. Is your is your initial thought like, well, maybe I should just talk to the bandit king and see if we can you know negotiate? Oh our yeah, release? no, that doesn't happen, Nathan. No, I didn't. Think you st- you stell you if you can you stealth in if you don't you brute force your way in. Right, right. Um, I I've never seen a party go. Maybe we should try this through diplomacy. It's like, no, I'm not gonna listen to the same person. Okay. This does feel like the other side of the coin, like we were talking about before. You know, you're you're doing the thing that's technically the good thing. You're supposed to be rescuing people from the bandit king, but from the bandit perspective, go back to that. It's like you didn't even try to negotiate. <laughs> like you didn't even ask. You didn't send an envoy. You didn't do anything. We 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 might have kidnapped somebody, but you didn't even know what our demands were. We didn't send a we, you you don't know if we wanted a ransom, anything like that. No, you just came in and started destroying our entire, uh, you know, our entire camp. Maybe the guy's in prison because he's a uh, you know, domestic terrorist. Maybe the bandits captured somebody who was actually stealing their livestock, or maybe he was an arsonist. Maybe yeah. your lord, whoever sent you on this rescue mission wants him because he's terrible and wants him to do more atrocious things or hey you know what on that notion maybe this guy that you're supposed to be freeing uh it was actually there trying to seek asylum with the bandits because if the lord gets a hold of him he's going to torture him for eternity uh maybe um a reference to a show you i'm sure you've never seen is full metal alchemist uh brotherhood i believe um Jay Kimbley is mm-hmm. insane, pyromaniac, like crazy. It's been a few years since I've seen the show. So if you've seen it and can correct me, feel free to. Um, anybody listening, that's not Nathan. Because Nathan doesn't watch anima. Not much. But he's basically has no qualms in killing mass amounts of civilians to, you know, do his way. Um, sure. He's Multiple times, they're like, yeah, he was in prison. Why? Because he's a raving lunatic. Sure. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, no, we want him because his methods are the way we want to do this. So that's that's uh, one thing. And in, in, in that instance, the uh, protagonist's morals do not align with this guy that's allegedly on the same side as them. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, generally, a lot. I think the easiest path towards um, going down the road to evil or just not even to being a we the bad guy status is definitely through violence oh yeah 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 yeah. that is usually part and parcel to what i would say the the technically the bad guy thing is but at the same time parties do usually end up in conflicts where they are specifically asked to get into combat so it is the kind of duality like, yeah, you, you're going to be doing combat, but we usually do associate violence with the the dark side of the force, essentially. Yeah. And, and it's not necessarily even combat because it in the, your uh, scenario here, it could just be infiltration. But I think that it's it's pretty safe to say that in general, uh, when you get a party together, especially in tabletop gaming, their initial thought is not I'm going to do the evil now. By intention. Unless the character's specifically set up in a way that they're supposed to be, like, this bad guy, this bad girl, this evil intentions, no good doer of bad things, you know, generally. No. with a wet noodle, that character. Bad uh, apple. Bad apple. So many of them. Um, and t- you put them all in one party together, that's always good. Um, yeah, so, you got a full bushel then. <laughs> you got a bushel of bad apples. <laughs> a bad bushel. Uh, so you have the bad bushel, that's that's what we're going to call our party now, the bad bushel. They're, they're, uh, they're going around being the bad bushel, and I think that this is kind of possibly one of the reasons why, by default status, most of the classes, especially in, like, D&D, or in other ones, really, are not necessarily evil by nature. Maybe in, like, a World of Darkness, possibly. But they don't really set it up quite that way in World of Darkness, either. It's not... I I think they're a little bit more morally ambiguous in a system like that. 
you're, you're vampires. You need to feed to live. But that's, that's again, that's like a hunger thing. It's not like you have a moral interest in, you know, draining people of blood. <laughs> I mean, that depends what clan you're belonging to, but... That also, yeah, if you're a Nosferatu, maybe that is absolutely what you're looking for. Um, Toreador, though, probably not. So, in, in a lot of cases, though, I don't think that they have, like, the uh, interest of making your characters specifically evil, where they say, yeah, you are now an evil character, you do evil things now. Do the evil now! Have you ever been in a party that specifically was going to do the evil, Alex? Um, technically, yes. Oh, okay. Because we, I had a one shot that was a monster campaign, and we were playing monsters. Oh. So we were going out to destroy a town of like dwarves. Uh, I don't remember if there was any plot or reason. It was just a one shot. I played a tr- uh, an undead troll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the only way one you could problem. kill me was with a remove curse spell, and like decapitating me would just make me paralyzed until my body grew back from my head. Fair enough. And cutting off limbs didn't really work because I had the trolls regeneration and the undead thing, so I could just put the limb back on and be like, meh. Or just grow a new one. <laughs> so so basically you are a more effective version of the of the Black Knight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um It is I was a playing, flesh wound. <laughs> I was using dwarves like footballs. Nice. He was also a little insane. Yeah, that was an uh, accidentally broken character, but it was for a monster campaign, so it's fine. Fine, fine. Yeah. Um I- I, I, I do find that a lot of times if you, if I'm playing an evil... Well, it's it's fun because we're doing the good one and then the evil one. That's usually how I play a lot of role-playing games that have those systems. I start by like saying, yeah, I'm going to be the hero. And then the second time through, it's like, yeah, but what if I was evil? <laughs> what would happen then? Um, and when you get into that scenario, it's just like, yeah, how how bad can we be? That's the that's like the new Vegas or the the fable, just like or just how bad can you get away with? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Which actually brings us to a really important question we should ask, which is, what consequences should your party face in the game for those Murder. evil actions? They get executed. They yeah. get executed. Um, there's a there's an axe. An yeah. option you have, are always welcome to use if you want your party to be. The bad guys is sending heroes after them. Oh yes. Just That's remember, good. heroes are just and not scoundrel like at all. Nope. So you'll send a lone hero hero or heroine to go after the party or the offended individuals. Maybe you start sending small uh contingents and Maybe roving you, bands of heroes. Yeah, maybe instead of through a mirror darkly, it's through a mirror lightly, and you have to deal with your counterparts that are. Oh, your your good your, your counterparts. Good, your good counterparts. They've taken off the mustaches, and <laughs> they they are mustacheless versions of you, and they have mustaches. to. And and they are specific. And if you are really a maniacal uh, GM. You make those characters specifically designed to deal with each member of the party. That's a little. I wouldn't. But understand that, that in a, a lot much. of a lot of fictions, they do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that episode of Futurama where they've got the parallel uh, universe that everything's decided by a coin flip. Right. <laughs> yep. Fog hat, gray bender, and gold bender. Evil, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's 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 that idea. Like I, I want to, um, I want to stop, uh, Bender. I create the anti-bending robot. Like it's right. <laughs> that, like that. They do that a lot. I, I've I've seen it quite a few times. But the thing about it is, um, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with that. You could even, if you wanted to, just mock up a system real quick about different bounty levels. You know how much bounty are your are your party uh, getting, and what would happen at this level when they get to this level of bounty? What's that going to attract? How yeah, many I think an easy way to do that would just be able to like establish what <laughs> laws and what crimes are worth in your in your world. Oh yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily think a lot of games have that. 
No. As a thing. Like, I don't know offhand, like, maybe you do for your own personal game at home, guys. Uh, and ladies and friends. Uh, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, folks. Uh, <laughs> folks at home. But maybe, like, 5e, I don't think there's, like, crimes. I don't think there's a section in the book on crimes. Not that I'm aware of. Um, but, like... If so, it's not utilized very much. <laughs> yeah, I've Ooh. never heard anyone talk about well, I committed a lot of crimes. Like, in what jurisdiction? Oh, you know. Yeah. Um, but crimes and stuff like that, and generally, stuff that are... It, it, good and evil is a thing, but, like, crimes are a real thing. If you're killing guards, that's a crime. Mm-hmm. In most cases. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like... You should have, like, a wanted poster or, like, bounties or, like, they should be sending stuff after you. And I know some, a lot of cases, like, they'll send, like, they'll put a bounty on your head and they'll send, like, assassins after you sometimes like that. Sure. Uh, that's what happens in Skyrim. Yeah. For instance, if you steal from someone and they see it, they'll put a bounty on your head and you'll get an assassin come after you. Or a guard will put it, they'll put a crime on your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This happens in New Vegas as well. Uh, if you run afoul of the NCR or Caesar's Legion, they start sending people after you. They yeah. will do that. Yeah. And I feel like if you're playing an evil centric party, uh, sorry, sure. a, a morally compromised mm, compromised <laughs> party, uh, I feel like that is something you should have to deal with. It's, sure. The guys and girls and the people who think they're in the right that are di- diametrically opposed to what you're doing. I feel like townships and uh, even if the peasants just rise up and, and make a levy, like maybe the peasants come after you. Yeah. Maybe the townsfolk fuck, uh, get their pitchforks and, and their torches and they come after you as a mob. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they also uh, double down on the uh, the guards in town and start putting in additional measures that make it harder for you to even get into the town in the first place. Put in additional, like, uh, traps and, you know, uh, sentries and stuff, so it's harder for you to actually do stuff when you if you decide that you do want to attack the town or if you want to steal stuff in the middle of the night. They start, they start trying to thief-proof the town. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could actually do in response to that. I can see that you'd have, like, the holy warriors of, like, paladins, but then you'd probably also have mercenaries if it was, like, the local constabulary saying, uh, we're sending out a reward, they're going to want to come out for the money. So now you're going to have a multitude of different kinds of threats that are coming after you. Right. Yeah, uh, especially if when, when you start to become truly the worst you know, when you when you truly become the worst, what are you, what's going to happen? Um, in a case like uh, Fable, which I mentioned in the last episode, I believe, um, the, there's there's a whole thing where you have the the dark side and the light side, and it does affect how people see you. But because there's like a timer on on all of it, uh, you can come back later, and they've forgotten your crimes. So yeah, they with, forget that you exist for a while. Which is one of those things where it's not like you can't exploit that. If you just if you just eradicate everybody in town and then just buy their houses for cheap money and then just come back later and everybody's moved back in and forgot that you did anything. <laughs> and now you just own everything in town. Not that I ever did that. Not know. that you've ever done something no, I like never that. did that, no. Yeah, what if your party slaughters a whole town and just claims it and then sells all the rights to new people? Like, we've got a freshly unoccupied home, brand new, all the amenities, all the furniture you get ready to live in for yeah. sale. That's a whole other racket. I uh, I, I think that there's a, an interesting uh, idea if you wanted to do, like, a, a duality campaign, like the Through the Mirror Darkly campaign, where... Um, <laughs> where you have like your your evil characters and they go through and they're just raining a swath of destruction and then your good heroes come in after them to try and stop or fix everything that they broke <laughs> in their path. Would you would you want to play that as play one party and do all the things and then go back through and play as the other party and try to solve all the things? You know what would be really great um I was thinking either that or if you had the good party and then the bad party came in and screwed everything up for them. But here's a really interesting idea is if you had two different parties that were meeting essentially on different days, 
I was just thinking that actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the first the first party that that's meeting the the first first session is your good party, and they're going through that town. And then, or or the first one is the bad guys. They go through, and then the good guys are coming in in the next session are following after them, and trying to keep up. And then when eventually everybody meets up, then then there might be a conflict there. Yeah, I've actually heard of such type things happening. Uh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting idea. I, I think contiguous worlds are really fun. Oh yeah, it also I think helps with the idea that you might have a reason to play the bad guys because it's actually controlling a narrative that that is reliant on the other side. Um, you have the the good guys and the bad guys, and if you don't have one of those, it doesn't really work as a storyline. They they both have to be involved somehow. Um. I'm always kind of like besides money though, I never really understood what the motivations might be. Uh yeah. what other motivations you might have to cuz cuz realistically some of the worst villains that you could ever have and especially the worst villains that you'd ever want to play are the ones that really just don't have a motivation. Their motivation is evil. Yeah. They're just M- evil is not a motivation in the end of itself. Yeah, you can't really have the well, I'm in the business of evil. What I I'm I'm part of evil corporation. That's what I do. It doesn't really the e- work. The Evil League of Evil. Yes, the Evil League of Evil. In very much the same way, actually, as you wouldn't just be in the good business. What does that mean? <laughs> like, why are you in the good business? What does that actually benefit to you? So, Because um, it's good. Because it's good, and you should just enjoy it. But the, the business of evil is not a very interesting one. There has to be an actual... Re- like, there's there's definitely, like... In, in the real world, even, there's criminal organizations and stuff, but they do criminal organization stuff for reasons outside of being criminals. There's, there's usually monetary gain involved or, or uh, power or influence or anything like that going on behind the scenes. No one really just does evil because reasons. Like, right. there's always reasons for things. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's an interesting thing to set up. If you were perhaps, starting a game, and you had characters that were morally compromised, <laughs> as we're going to call, call them now. Do you think Session Zero is basically establishing what the motivation for the characters are? <laughs> uh, I think it would have to be, or finding some way that they are like figuring out exactly what ways they're morally compromised. Maybe there's a dastardly deed that they commit on the first uh, Session Zero. Oh yeah, see that's interesting because I I feel like that's one of those uh w- one of those snowball effects. Like you start them off with yeah you did this thing, and then everything that they have to do past that is to try and cover up or mitigate or or evade the bad thing that they did. So yeah, there's... maybe they maybe the session zero is hiding a body, and session one the body's been found. Did session one body's found? Okay, what are you gonna do? How far are you gonna go? Mm, there's some good stuff right there. To what there. lengths are you going to cover up this murder? Yeah, are you going to have to beg, borrow, and steal? Uh, you, how many other bodies are there going to be before the end of this? It's an interesting uh, scenario to work through. All the bodies. Yeah, exactly. All the bodies. All the bodies. Um, so there is uh, that possibility. I, I think that in some ways, when we're talking about it in those terms... The evil party, so to speak, is sort of controlling a narrative more than the good party technically would. Like if you're the if you're the GM in that scenario, I think you have to seed a little bit more of where the story is going to an evil party and then react to what they're doing. So essentially you have to take the reverse role. You have to be like the GM that's acting as the essence of good for the party more than trying to direct a good party to their destination, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Next question. Um, (laughs) which I'm sure some people listening to this have probably been asking themselves right now. Should we really encourage evil characters? (laughs) Everyone needs to be encouraged, Nathan. (laughs) Be the best you you can be. (laughs) If that happens to be evil... (laughs) <laughs> I think that I think that's really one of the one of the reasons I think most times uh you know parties will go down a good path most of the time the reason why um there there isn't an encouragement or a lot of 
models for the evil character is specifically because of that question and the answers that come out of it is, are we really going to encourage people to be evil in the game? Like, it's great to have the, the ability to swing on that moral spectrum, but it does feel like it's never really encouraged to do so, and they're... Like, like, there's always a reason why you might benefit from it, especially because it's a self, it, it's a selfish option rather than selfless option. But the the general idea <laughs> that we want to, uh, it, are are we encouraging it by having the evil part represented there? I don't know. I again, I don't feel like most characters are really that as much as there's a moral gray area that they end up inhabiting. <laughs> Your thoughts on the matter, do you think that we... Is, is Are we encouraging evil characters, even just by the notion of having evil on an alignment chart? I don't think that it encourages evil characters. You're like, you don't hear about evil characters nearly as often. Um, I think it is a good idea to allow players' motivation, or character motivations to sway their actions however mm. mm-hmm. so i think it's smart to create characters with compelling motivations traits flaws and characteristics that oh <laughs> i guess my lust for money and the fact that i will do anything for it means i might be a little evil i don't think we sh- i don't think it's the encouragement of characters to be bad it's the encouragement sure. of characters to do things that are in their self interest mm-hmm. not necessarily caring about what others they hurt or what they damage along the way this is actually one of the I, I think issues that i had when it came to the alignment charts which is that it it felt like i was now going to be locked into a particular morality when i feel like that's always an evolution to to be completely fair to the morality chart, and not really fair to be completely honest to the morality chart in this instance, mm. most of those are very mutable under different circumstances for a person or character. Sure, sure. Um, because it's going to be, oh, yeah, I'm lawful good. It's like, always? And they're like, yeah, always. And you give them a situation that's like that they would absolutely not be like lawful or good in. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, no, I do that. So it's like that's not lawful or good. Mm-hmm. That's that's neither. That's morally gray, right, and terrible. <laughs> and then there's the other case that I uh, th- that happens a lot, uh, especially in video games. But I, I think you could also look at it in tabletop, which is it's not so much the I'm the good guy or I'm the bad guy, but you have some options that might get you to the same basic point. Uh, but how you deal with it tells a lot about the character. So, yeah. so the example that I would give there, and one that is worth talking a little bit about, is Mass Effect. I don't. I think you might have played one or two of those, but yeah, I played a little bit of one, a little bit of one. Um, but anyway, in that, Shepard uh, can go down the path of the Paragon, which is the good path, or the Renegade, which is the bad path. Now the overall goal is going to be the same regardless but it does determine how you deal with each scenario and what was interesting is when they talked to the game developers um they were they were like they were actually kind of sad that like 70 80 percent of the people that played played through the paragon path when they had so many more interesting things they thought were going on in the renegade path (laughs) Yeah. But not many, like, I think it was only actually about 17% of people actually did the renegade <laughs> pathway um, when they thought, no, but that's where the interesting stuff was for them, at least. Yeah. Uh, it still gets you to essentially the same, that's actually the problem with Mass Effect 3, is that it essentially gets you to the same point at the end, but but it does inform you a lot about your character and how they're willing to address situations. If I'm right. if I'm going to try and talk to this reporter or if I'm going to punch the reporter in the face because that's actually one of the choices you have to make at one of the junctures. Um you know, you're you're asking a pointed question. Well, I can be diplomatic about it, or I could just punch you. Uh these are these are two options that Shepard get. Now, it, it both of them complete the interaction. 
(laughs) But but it determines a lot about what's going to happen and inform the future of your uh, of your interactions with them and other members of your party, other characters and how the world sees you. Uh, It does move you past that scenario. So there's a lot of reasons why in a tabletop game. You might take the, like we were talking about earlier, you might take the option of being very violent, or you might take the option of trying to use diplomacy that might get you to the same endpoint, but it will affect how a lot of groups see you. Potentially, yeah, as long as you have cause and effect. <laughs> and that's the thing, is that um, we were mentioning it with the good, with the good party, but in, in the evil party too, I feel like cause and effect is usually glossed over a lot in most campaigns. Um, yeah, I would definitely feel uh, as if, especially a pre-written campaign, for instance, Mm. it's a lot harder if it's not written in there, unless it's specifically written in there, I think, to have cause and effect in such situations where your actions cause reactions. Sure. Yeah. I, uh... That's something I would have always liked to see fleshed out in tabletop because that's one of the few round you can't do that in video games nearly as easily. In tabletop you can have much more dynamic ways I of think doing it's that. I think it's better done in video games though. Oh, it's done more often. It's And it's <laughs> done well. It is done well. Because again, the Skyrim example <laughs> I saw caught this guy stealing from me and now there's a bounty on his head. Yeah, it's instantaneous. Yeah, in in video games. Yeah, if you kill someone and they find out about it, they'll send an assassin after you. Oh yeah, yeah. Because of X, Y happens. Yes, and that and that I think it would be amazing to do this and find a good way to operate this in a tabletop. Esp- um, especially because since it is so much Odyssey of the mind, there is a much richer and more complex way that that can be implemented in tabletop. The issue with that, whoever comes down to uh, essentially bookkeeping, um, where yeah. you would have to log, in a sense, mm. every single encounter of a certain kind. So like, oh... This player did this to this person, so this, you know, mm-hmm. X did, uh, A did B to C, so D happens. Right. I, um, I don't know. I think it's more or less just keep some notes of notable stuff that happens for reference later. You might not have to do so much bookkeeping as it is just trying to keep, keep apprised of interactions especially interactions with npcs or groups and remember that for the future because if your party encounters them again or if that group is powerful enough or maybe you maybe you ran afoul of a prince maybe you stole from a prince their family might want to take retribution and a lot of those you could probably note like i feel like a lot of game masters especially after you've done it for a while will probably you you see this with some of the best of them is that it's almost like a mental note that comes up like oh i see you did that thing Mm, i gotta remember that because that's probably gonna come back to haunt you like like that that even happened with my campaign once or twice but no one ever got to see what came of it because we we didn't go that long uh, it got cut very, very short. But I realized certain things about, like, when the character happens to do this one thing, mm, yeah, I feel like that's going to come back to haunt you. And I'm going to remember that because that's going to be important down the road. Uh, I didn't want my players to become so lax in just going and doing things without realizing that, yeah, you might want to be careful about who you talk to and what you say and how you interact with them, there may be very real consequences and interactions into the future that are direct causes of the, of, of, of uh, uh, direct effects to the cause. Um, that's what I always wanted to set up. I think that you see some GMs that do that very well, but for the casual person, I just don't think it comes into play very often. Like it's not something that you normally think about. Yeah. What happens when my character does something that I think is, you know, generally evil? Well, 
the natural inclination is to just move on and get to the next thing. Uh, but when you think about it, those, those interactions can end up being some of the best story beats because you can flesh them out later. Right. I think p- the issue there is the hesitance to deviate from a, a certain story path. Yeah. So say you have an interaction that doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go. Mm. And they do a different thing. It's like, all right, but I had this planned. Right. So I'm going to go with what I have planned. Yeah. You know, yeah. or what the script says. Or, you know, well, I didn't plan on that happening. I don't know how to go along with it. Sure. Yeah. So I think the issue there in a lot of uh, cases, especially for more casual uh, DMs, for instance, would be the, oh, well, they just killed the guy in cold blood instead of talking to him and took the information off. Like, he didn't tell them any information, I guess. Sure, he had a note on him or something that had the information. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's the coming up with things like that to kind of figure out what happens from that. Yeah. Yeah. Um and, and and actually that kind of leads back to that question about that we were asking about the uh, should we really encourage evil characters because I'm starting to think I don't think it's necessarily you encourage evil characters but when characters go evil the idea that there are real consequences to that and that you can show them I think is really important and actually can be very useful to storytelling. I love showing players consequences. Yeah, yeah. They usually die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If if your character were to just go off, I'm not saying that I want to necessarily encourage them to go and do murder hoboing, but if they do go and do the murder hoboing, the idea that, yeah, you're not just going to get away with that. Things are going to happen. There are going to be those consequences like we've been laying out in this episode. I think that's actually very informative and very helpful to define characters and where they go from there. If they keep going down that dark path or if they turn back to the light or what happens to them afterward. But the consequences are really important. Yeah. And I think one thing, too, is even if you don't have immediate consequences, it could be really fun and interesting if you set up things ahead too let's say you killed six or seven people down by the river and in a van and (laughs) invest and you don't have to yeah in a van van you don't have to tell the players that it's like oh this is actively being investigated but like maybe and here here comes in the uh the subtle information drops that you do like when you're uh there's one great meme post it's like um when describing stuff to your characters, don't emphasize the importance of what is what. Yeah. It's like, uh, there's an army of 600 orcs and a kitten <laughs> and whatever like that. And right. you pet the kitten and it's like, yeah, it, the orcs are pleased. <laughs> the orcs are pleased. Yeah. I've seen that one on one of the D&D meme ones. And it's just like, don't emphasize the importance. Like, the little subtle information there. Maybe they'll pick up on it. Maybe they don't. Maybe it's nothing they can, like, even make a roll on, you know? Mm -hmm. But, like, yeah, there's this guy, and, like, if you're glossing over information, you talk about this person, this person, that person, and, then like, this person, who's very much, like, noncommittal, like, just have, it's something that's very not ominous at all, just there. Right, right. But, like, it's recurring, for instance, Mm. several times. Mm-hmm. And maybe they'll ke- pick up on it. Maybe they won't. But then it's like, yeah, that was a private investigator, and like he's got enough information on you where the constabulary is is sending a squadron on you now. Yeah, yeah. And now what are you gonna do? Um, but like, even let's say they picked up on it. Yeah. Like you never said anything about it to him. You never gave him any prompts. But they're like, that guy's been here every single time. Maybe they go and interact with that guy. Yep. And then it comes to light mm. that, oh, yeah, he's 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 spying on him. Yeah. Oops. <clears throat> and then what are you going to do if that guy's spying on you, for instance? You're going to murder him? Well, that just means that, well, he was on a mission and got... You're going to have to cover that up or else they're going to be like, all right, these guys probably did it because he was investigating them and they were here and he died here, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. This is uh, this is very much the Breaking Bad story. Essentially. Yeah. <laughs> I have not seen Breaking Bad, so I don't know. I have okay. No idea. But uh, this is less on uh, maybe characters that are bad, but are ways to interact with characters who want to be bad, I think, at this point in the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a good way to phrase that. Um, what happens when the characters are are curious about being bad guys <laughs> what happens when your hero thinks hey why am i being the good valiant hero when there's more money or uh or power to be had from being the bad guy what do i do then? and that's the other thing too is usually in the act of not necessarily being good being morally compromised as we put it <laughs> um being bad it's more about the power um, mm -hmm. and self-interest and you're taking things that you want and doing things for your own or your own group's interests. Yeah. So yeah. it's like you gain power. Right. And people might learn to fear you. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, well, we need to deal with this guy. He's gaining lots of power and he's kind of scaring the populace or whatever. So like there's lots of different ways you can deal with characters that go down that road. But a character that is going down that road, maybe their goal is power. And different ways to accumulate power. So, sure. for instance, a way you could accumulate power is offing the local lord and taking his mantle. <laughs> We've deposed your lord. Bow to me and pay us taxes. Right. Right. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why, like, if you introduce a very powerful object, that's also a thing. You could introduce a very powerful object into a game and say, hey, this powerful object could be yours, but if you take it, um, this is also a power source for uh, an entire town. And they're going to be in blackout territory once you do that. Actually, there's a similar mission in, um, uh, if you remember in New Vegas, the, uh, the Lucky Old Sun quest when you go to Helios 1. Um, you go there, you can reset those, uh, panels, the solar panels to divert, um, you know, power to the strip or to the west side or, you know, all over Vegas, wherever you want to take it. Or you can power up the super laser so that when you get the Sea Finder, Euclid Sea Finder, you can send down a beam of light to destroy anything it hits. Yes. Now, now there's a there's a thing where you're going to provide power to a lot of people, but on the other hand, I can have a devastating weapon that I can use once a day. You may want to pick that option because right. it's going to benefit you, but you've also set up the thing where if you take that option, it doesn't just benefit you, it negatively affects everyone else. Now, what do you want to do? obviously use that option on those negatively affected people to make them more impacted negatively. That's right. What you do is then you go to the strip and you use the sea finder to just <laughs> to just blow everybody up with a giant space laser. Uh, that's what you do. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of those scenarios where uh, you might think to yourself, yeah, I'm the good guy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do the good thing. And then if you, if you, introduce an element into that where you're like okay okay but you know orb of power you want to pick it up <laughs> do you what what, yeah. what 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 happens if i pick it up you'll have the orb of power uh okay um and, and are there consequences oh yeah there are a lot of consequences to that i can tell you what they are but now you have to make a moral you have to make a moral decision right now Am I going to choose power, or am I going to do what I think is right for the whole? Am I going to do what's right for me, or what's right for everybody else? And those those scenarios are just more interesting anyway, because it really makes people think about what they're willing to compromise, be morally compromised, <laughs> how they want to be morally compromised in that scenario, and if they're willing to do that for a lot, a lot of power. Yeah, I think that there's there's some interesting... But again, go back to those consequences. You know, uh, what happens when you pick up that orb? Okay, well, now you have a lot of power, but there are indeed consequences, and you can see those consequences immediately, or possibly you don't necessarily see the weight of it yet. If you don't do that, then people are just going to pick up that orb every single time. <laughs> Damn straight. Yeah, absolutely. There's no. I'm going to pick up that silver sword because it was a silver sword. Of course I want it. Yeah, not like good. Not like, good a, idea. Not, not like the Githyanki are going to come after me. Don't worry about it. It's all good. 
Yeah, okay. I had one other question, though, and this does feel like a weighted one, but uh, it's also an important one. I think it's going to matter more to people. Um, but is there a case that you can make for the anti-hero party? Uh, can you go into more detail about that question? Okay, imagine if you have a, let's say, suicide squad. Sure, they're all dead. Or a de- <laughs> Or or a Deadpool is probably the better example for it. Um, is there a case that you could make for a party that's going to essentially do some bad things for the right reason? So your anti-hero party, essentially what I'm saying is they are going to work outside of of the law, maybe even outside of what we consider civilization in order to achieve what is generally considered a good outcome. Sure, I don't have any problem with that. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely some problems associated with that, too. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're operating outside the law, which means... Yeah, they, they're outlaws. <laughs> they're outlaws, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're outlaws. They work outside they're the law. They're bounty hunters. They're uh, potentially doing harmful things. They're collateral damage. There's a lot of... Uh, variables that are not accounted for with anti-heroes. That's true. They're definitely like are. Deadpool as a, is a, a, I know he's an anti-hero even before you said that. Yeah. But um, Deadpool functions on his own morality. This is true. Maximum and effort. <laughs> it's like they can't rein him in. That's the thing with, with vigilantes. and whatnot. It's like they operate outside of your jurisdiction, so they're not going to be reined in. Uh, which means that, in many ways, the actual lawful characters and potentially the actual good, traditionally good characters are still probably going to come at you. Like, it, it definitely feels like that's a possibility that would present itself in that. that the guards well, even then, if the, if the allegedly good characters come after you, you're anti-heroes for that, then they're also operating outside of jurisdiction based on their own morality and judgment as well. This is true. Unless the actual uh, governors or provincial characters give them license to do that because you're working outside of that jurisdiction. Yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to see a situation where you've given these bad characters license to do the thing they are doing. Basically, you're looking for, like I'm thinking, realistically, the Suicide Squad kind of thing. Yeah, essentially that, except, you know... Uh, not just necessarily against one bad guy and expecting them all to die. It's just like, yeah, we, we, we're going to let you do the thing you're doing and here's your get-out-of-jail-free card, essentially. Yeah, it's the uh, it, it's like maybe maybe you literally do have the bomb collars. <laughs> and and now there's the problem of, uh, yeah, what, what do we do with these folks? Um, you know, you have criminal records. You did a lot of bad things in your past. You are, you know super powered and you're not taking it anymore and you have a lot to atone for and we are going to force you to do our will and uh to be fair that is actually a really uh smart idea i think if you wanted to play the not so good heroes mm. or the anti-heroes or the uh kind of bad guys is session zero be like all right so i want everyone in this party to have a criminal background mm-hmm you need to have at least one major offense that you were imprisoned for mm-hmm. and start from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a neat idea. Um, because then it's like, all right, well, we're, we're, it would be a sense of com- camaraderie even from them from being in prison together, potentially. Um, and the fact they're all kind of operating outside of the law. And it's like, you all kind of were under arrest for these things, but your skills make you really beneficial for something we need done. And it's like, we're not going to forgive your crimes, but like, we'll let you kind of out of jail. Sure. If you work with us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and then if you go too far outside the line, then we're going to have to rein you in. And it's not going to be going to jail that time. It's going to be execution. Right. Right. The the other case where I remember the bomb callers was actually also from New Vegas, but it was dead money. 
And yeah. you probably, I don't know if you played that expansion or not. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. But th that idea that, yeah, these four disparate characters that have gotten caught here by Father Elijah, we, we need you to break into the Sierra Madre. <laughs> and some of you are not necessarily good people <laughs> um, in, in, this, in this scenario. Well, Dean, but, you know, you're being forced into a scenario in order to complete a mission. On that note, I actually did play in a essentially the anti-hero party at one time. That would be the heist mission that I went on. Um, and in, in that one, I was, I believe I was a bardic character? I want to say I was a bardic character, but we had thieves and we had enforcers and stuff, and our entire job was to go into a casino and to steal the loot that was in a vault down in the bottom and come up with a game plan so that we could escape with the money. Now, Ocean's Eleven it's, it's Ocean's Eleven, basically. And um, had a couple days to prep. The guy that we were given the mission from, though, had a score to settle with this guy. And he had, you know, he had done something bad to his family. And, and you know, this this guy shouldn't have all this money. Like, that's kind of like the whole idea is like... He's making money off the backs of, of hard working people. We got to take the money away from him. So, so you're essentially doing something to stop somebody who's not good. You're, you're, you're taking money away and trying to steal from the thief, essentially, the guy that did the bad thing. Um, but in order to do that, you have to pull off a heist. You're Ocean's Eleven right. now. So yeah. Danny Ocean, not necessarily the bad guy, but definitely anti-hero because he is doing the crimes. You know, um, so so I have done that and no time, though, during that did I ever feel like I was really the bad guy. It's just I'm pulling off a heist. Um, so, yeah, actually, I think there's an interesting uh, case to be made for trying to set up an antihero party specifically. Uh, in lieu of all of that, you just set your game in uh, colonial Australia <laughs> and you make all your characters drop bears. No, it's just everyone's a, a, a forsaken, exiled prisoner. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So everyone's got something they did. Everyone, everyone, got, everyone, everyone's got something they did, and now everyone's got something to hide. Now it's just a survival against Australia. Yeah, now you got to deal with drop bears and kangaroos. And, you got to deal and with giant kangaroos. spiders and the Florida of the world. Yeah, you got to deal with all of those sharks in the reef. There's a whole bunch of problems that you got to deal with. Boomerang, stray boomerangs. There's a whole lot of problems that you have to deal with. That's a survival game. Yeah, that is a... a Horror survival modern. game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what's interesting is that there's a lot, of, a lot of genres of, like, video games that you don't necessarily have the ability to do in tabletop form, but one that I don't usually see very often is the idea of horror survival. I feel like you could actually do that as an RPG. There's, there's several of those. They're not really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I've seen horror games, like you know, I, I obviously like cosmic horror, like a Cthulhu, but I'm like actual like survive, like you'd have to have like hunger meter meters and stuff like that, and it's yeah, that's uh, annoying. There, there's a lot of those actually. Oh, there are not in tabletop, but oh yeah, like board games. No video games, there's a bunch of those. Oh no, there's a ton in video game. What I mean is that they, I, I haven't really seen it in tabletop version. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, horror in general, like actual horror, yeah, uh, is a bit lacking. It's a lot harder to pull off that suspense and uh, whatnot. It can be, but the uh, but the survival aspect too. I feel like there's there is definitely a uh, way you could do survival in tabletop as like just a, a mechanism. Like it's not you being the the big bad guy or good guy like we're talking about right here but just trying to survive the game world that has been presented to you and not die yeah. that seems like a, an interesting plot point oh uh, that's actually a perfect scenario for the whole you did a bad crime and now people are trying to come after you the whole <laughs> the whole thing like well now i'm just trying to fight for my life i guess the the just general question i'll ask toward the end here is uh do, do you do you really want to play an evil character? I thought you were going to ask if I wanted to build a snowman. Okay, do you want to build a snowman? I want to build an evil snowman. Okay, now for the other question. Do you really want to play an evil character? Sure. Okay. If they're interesting and compelling 
and they're not just boring. I myself actually do have ideas for evil characters that I would play, but I think they're more comically evil. Like they're like they're they're not necessarily doing evil things, but they're evil by their like they're they're inherent evil, but they don't necessarily do those those sort of things. I'd like to see tragically evil characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I I had an idea for like a minotaur that had been trapped in like a labyrinth for most of his life and then when the hero came through the through the main door he saw an opportunity to you know kill the hero and get out of the thing and then realized that like since things have changed so much around him I mean he's a minotaur he's going to be kind of evil but there's a there's a real future in monster hunting so now he's just a monster hunter and and yeah, I mean he he doesn't really fit in very well to society because like he wants to drink from skulls and stuff, but he's just trying to make it in the world now. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just I think that those or, or like necromancers that really overestimate their ability and think they're a lot stronger than they actually are, like <laughs> with 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 ideas of like grandeur that they don't necessarily have the ability to pull off. I just think that those characters, where they're almost like a comic villain, are also fun. They're just... Yeah, they definitely can. But in terms of the just, I am an evil, <laughs> like, like I'm just a serial killer now. No, I don't really, I don't see that as being something I'd want to play. I don't want to be Hannibal Lecter. Like, that's not a character that I'd prefer to play in a, in a tabletop game. I, I just can't find enough fava beans. Yeah, or a nice Chianti. Yeah, you usually find pretty cheap Chiantis, actually. Oh, well, never mind that. I said a nice one. So exactly, whatever. exactly. There's most most Chiantis I find usually at places where I frequent uh, are usually pretty cheap and probably watered down. So yeah, you gotta find yes. a nice one. Exactly. In, in one of those basket holders. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, okay. So that's uh, what I guess we have to say about evil characters uh, or evil parties and what happens when our good party and our evil party do the Dawn of Justice thing. <laughs> um, mm. And, and they, they stare at each other menacingly across the table. Um, but in case you were interested in anything else that might be uh, morally compromised <laughs> in gaming... Alex, where could they find more content on the internet? Well, morally compromised content? There's a couple websites I can't tell you here. Delve Triple X. Um, but you can find stuff from us <laughs> over at Delve. Uh, wow. Over at Delvecast.com. <laughs> Del Delvecast Triple X. Uh, no, sorry, that's our OnlyFans account. You can find all of the stuff we do over there, and you can just click on our Patreon and uh, check out some of the special uh, early release stuff and special bonuses that we have over there. Again, thank you. The entire episode we just recorded. The entire episode that we just recorded with all of the gaffes and goofs that normally go along with it. Oh, no. Uh, thank you to our shiny level patron, Bonnie Ainsworth, and also to our Discord shiny patron, Drunk Paul. Uh, they help keep the digital lights on. And uh, if you are on any kind of social media, you can find us there. Uh, I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And we had uh, mentioned it on the last episode, but I think it's worth reiterating here if you are just, like, listening to them back and forth, back-to-back, uh, -back, I should say, uh, is we are still looking for some information on what your favorite villains are and why. Uh, yes. So we, we have some ideas of our own, and we'll probably end up doing an episode about it in the near future. Um, but, uh, we're, we're interested in that. Probably more pertinent for this episode than it was even in the last one, so, uh, worth, worth talking about. We're not going to tell you what ours are, yet. Nope, not yet. We're going to do that later. Uh, until then, though, thank you for listening. We will see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.